All right, so this is the part about political philosophy. And then, like I said, right now, uh, you don't have to read Plato's Crito or you don't have to read Henry David Thoreau, but I think they're really good and they're worth reading. That's why I picked them. Uh, like I said, right now, Plato is talking about why you have a responsibility towards the government. So remember we talked about Socrates and how Socrates uh, was on trial for corrupting the youth because he was questioning authority. Um, so what happens at the end, they try to bust him out of jail and say, hey, this is a bullshit case. We know this wasn't fair. This is not just. They're just really after you. And... And why don't you just get out of here? We'll help you get out of jail. We have money. So Plato and all his other students, like I said before, there are a lot of rich kids, so they have money. They can get him out. They have connections. They even promise him, like, if, if you um, come with us and you let us bust you out of the prison, then we have people in other cities that you can stay with. You have friends. So you don't have to worry about that. And Plato says no. He's going to stay and he's going to take the death penalty. He's going to take the hemlock, the poison himself. And he's not going to go anywhere. And his student cries like, why would you do that? Why? You know, this is a bullshit case. You know, they didn't like you. They put up to a vote. Why would you do this? And his response is, is that if he runs out now, then Basically, what did all his philosophy mean? He talked about all this stuff about what is justice. He wouldn't find out, you know, what was the right thing to do, what was good. And at the end, when it becomes hard, he's going to just skip town and say, screw it. He says, well, then all my philosophy is basically bullshit. Everything that I said was bullshit. If I can't um, basically stand up and take the heat um and in part he says why can't I just run out on the government and their rules why can't i just break the rules for myself and just say screw it is that he says the government gave him his life so who gave him an education who gave him resources who gave him shelter who gave him all these things to live he says well it's the government even more than his parents like he's like he even goes into the part where he talks about his parents are like well they got educated and they grew up because of the government as well right so the real parent for all of us is the government if we didn't have that then we would all be lost and that's why he can't just skip town. He's like, if I agreed to live by the rules, then, and they gave me all these things, then I can't just run away when they want to punish me. Thoreau, on the other hand, uh, is really different. Thoreau is a modern philosopher. Uh, well, I guess you could say modern in that he was um, alive in the, 1800s, the 19th century. Uh, he is an American philosopher and he wants to argue that really there are times when you are justified fighting against the government. So this is what he means by civil disobedience. It's like, I don't have to obey the government all the time. Sometimes it makes sense not to obey the government. And what and how he tries to justify that is that he brings up two issues. He says, the revolution um, divided the states, right, in the United States. So then it was about slavery later in the Civil War. So he says, if you look at the whole slavery issue, at that time, slavery is legal in the United States when he's alive. And he says, and he's from the north and he's like how can you own people how can you treat people like that 
and make it legal. So even if the government says it's legal, how can you do that? And also he points out too, which is really relevant for us, is the Mexican-American War, which, remember, Texas leaves Mexico, right? They revolt against Mexico. They join the South in their slave state, right? And then later they try to take over even more of the land, right? So the United States takes all the land all the way to Cal what we call California, right? And this is all used to be Mexico. So he also says, throw who's an American? He says, This isn't fair either. This is bullshit that we started this war just to take over land. And it says just because the government says again that they're behind it, that they support this, doesn't make it right. So he says, How am I not how am I gonna fight against this? How am I gonna uh, fight against the government? How am I gonna show that I don't agree with them? Is he's he agrees not to pay the poll tax. He's not gonna pay his taxes because why am I going to give my money to support something that I don't believe in and the government that I don't believe that they're doing something right? It says, when it really comes down to it, the government should be working for you. You're not working for the government. Does that make sense? So a tax, he thinks that a tax is working for the government? Every money that I earn, some of it goes for the government because, well, I live here. Yeah, because, I mean, how else are you going to pay for the war, right? Right, yeah. So yeah, the soldiers are not paying themselves, right? The government pays the soldiers, right? Yeah, so he's like, why am I going to pay these taxes for a war that I don't support? And he actually talks about against... Um, voting so most of like this is why it's really relevant right now most people are going to say oh you should vote but he's like voting when it comes down to it this is why i think he has a problem like plato has a problem with voting is that it's just everybody's opinion you know yeah he's, he's the whole masses that is going to yeah so to agree said, with something yeah, and it says, well, the well, the majority of the South agree with slavery, you know. <laughs> and he's like, well, it doesn't make it right, like just because everybody agrees and votes on it and say, okay, we all agree to be a slave state. It's like Texas is going to be slave state. It's like we all voted on it. It's like how is that justified? Like, so he he's kind of saying like. Voting is kind of misguided because it's like you're you're gambling with serious issues. Like you're making it a game. Like how many people can you get to vote for your side? But even though it has really serious issues. And so hopefully you guys can see what I mean by that, that it's relevant right now, right? What's with what's going on? <laughs> is that it's like, well, wait a minute, we're gonna fight about Democrat, Republican, whatever when people are dying, you know? Or it's about money, or it's about land, or it's about something superficial like that. And so he really disagrees. He's like, the government has no ultimate right. Like the real rights come from the individual and our right to live and live the way, and the healthy way that we want to. So the government should be helping us do that, not that we should be working for the government, making them do all this stuff for us. So how do we, so I'm gonna flash forward because I won't spend too much time on this. <laughs> See, everybody just popping in, okay. So let me go forward real quick and I want to talk about social contract and this is Rawls. So what social contract is, it's a political philosophy 
but it's also kind of a moral philosophy. And what social contract is about is that you make contracts with people, agreements. So you say, well, this is the whole thing about government and everything else, right? We make an agreement with the government. If I pay my taxes, you're going to give me back services. So who pays for the fire department? Who pays for the police department? It's us, right? We're supposed to benefit. And that's kind of like how you keep the peace. If you make sure everybody follows the rules and everybody's going to benefit if they just do what they're supposed to do. The problem is, is people, and you can see this right now, this is exactly what they're talking about. When people start trying to break the rules for themselves and get selfish, they start messing it up for everybody. This is why no one has toilet paper right now. So when people get selfish, they affect everybody else, right? Yeah, that's why we have panic buying as well, right? It's not the yeah. collapse of society, is other people. So let me hold stuff before the other guys do it. Yes. And this is why this is why there's social contract is about, and this is Rawls here. Rawls is a I want to say more modern philosopher. Uh, he passed away, I don't know, um, not that long ago, but um, he in the 60s, so this is the paper you're supposed to be working on. This is what you should be focused on. He wrote this paper in the 60s, and, he's, and it's called The Justification of Civil Disobedience. So he's going to, he's, what he's trying to write about is why in some cases, it's justified to disobey the government. But he's going to take a different approach than Thoreau did. And so he's a social contractor. So he thinks that there should be rules. There should be a government. There should be rules. The government should make people follow the rules. Uh, but there are some times where we're justified by breaking the rules. And how is he going to justify that? He's going to say that if it's a legit form of civil disobedience, then you are right to reject what the government says. So how do you know it's a legit uh, expression of civil disobedience? Is that it's public. Meaning I can't really disobey the government inside my house with no one, like right now, with no one knowing what I'm doing, like that's not really civil disobedience. Why? Because it has to also be nonviolent. It has to have a political conviction. This is really important. You can't just protest, according to Rawls, because you feel like it. It actually you're protesting because you want something to change. You want the rules to change, the politics to change. There's something wrong that the government is doing. So how do you know that? It's based on two principles of justice. And I'll talk about that right now. And the action, you are conscientiously rejecting the law. So that's like what I was talking about with uh, Thoreau not paying the tax, right? He knows what that means. He knows what he's doing. It's not an accident. It's not like, well, I just don't want to pay my taxes. He's doing it because he wants to draw attention to a larger political issue of slavery and the way the United States took over Mexico. Like, he's saying these are serious issues, and I'm going to show everybody that I'm not on board with this. Like, so he wants it change some sort of policy, some law. So all these things have to happen or be there for Rawls to say it's a legit form of disobedience. Like you're right to reject it. Um, because the, what 
he's talking about what social contract is that social contract is agreements that we make sometimes verbally but sometimes we don't like i agree not to steal your stuff you agree not to steal my stuff right and sometimes we say that but sometimes we it's kind of like unsaid right we just assume like don't touch my stuff and i won't touch your stuff and so we have this kind of agreement going on um everything is fine as every as long as everybody follows the rules right but that's what we're talking about with the whole thing about the toilet paper and all that it's when people start trying to take advantage and trying to get more than everybody else is when all the agreements all the are you rules. gonna upload the slides for us uh i will upload this recording the video the entire video so you can go back to the video and it'll show you the slides and everything okay so we, it is recording so we just go back to it back and forth yeah okay but you can ask, ask questions right now if you want to uh so you make sure you understand anything that i go over so if we have questions do we email you no you can just ask them right now oh well i don't think i have any right now <laughs> but like okay. later on if we're reading yeah, it of course but okay. yeah if you have a question right now you want me to clear up a slide or something then i can do that right now okay um so where was that okay so then this is the whole contract thing because what Rawls is afraid of it. This is the whole thing with social contract. This is the thing that they're most scared of is that we're going to go back to a state of nature, meaning that what would life be like if we didn't have a government, if we didn't have rules, if we have no structure, no police, no fire department? What is it going to look like? It's going to look like this. Everybody's going to be out there trying to survive and it's going to get ugly. That's what I'm saying about the toilet paper issue right now. You see what people are doing right now. People get scared. People don't care about the rules anymore. People don't care about each other. And then now, what's happening? People are willing to fight, right? And it gets ugly. And then no one is safe. And so this is what we're doing right now. The whole isolation thing is like a social contract. We all agree to stay inside and isolate each other so ourselves so that everybody benefits so people don't get sick but you see how some people are breaking the rule that contract and going out and partying or whatever and infecting other people putting other people at risk so that's what they're about now the two things that i want to get clear you are according to Rawls justified in rejecting your government and that law on these two principles if the government is violating your liberty your ability to say and think what you want then that's an issue also if they're affecting or trying to control or restrict you from particular positions right it's not open to everybody so that's a whole thing of like who can be president who can be a senator who can be a congressman all that has to be like well wait a minute is it open for everybody or only for some people so the reason why Rawls is talking about this stuff in the 60s is because of segregation and the United States and how minorities couldn't have jobs and things like that so that's why uh he wants to do something about that so that kind of segregation stuff violates uh these two principles so that's when it's justified if it's violating these principles then you can reject the law and you can say the government's not doing something right Eric, is your mic on? Or something's. Are those birds? I'm stripping, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that was. Throwing me off. Okay, so uh, with Brawls is saying, okay, so 
that's the contract. You should follow the contract. Now, the last thing I do want to make clear. He doesn't say you can just break any law you want. So he's going to say you can't. He's not saying you can get rid of the entire government, like kick out everybody and just start new. He's like, no, 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 that's going to be ugly and terrible and a lot of people are going to get hurt. What you can do is just like Thoreau is doing, if you just reject not paying a tax so that they can fix a law like segregation or slavery or something like that, then it's legit. But he's not saying get rid of the government entirely. He's not an anarchist. Like he's not trying to destroy the government. He's just saying fix what we have. So why? Because it would be better for everybody. That's a social contract. That's what I'm saying. Like right now with the disease and everything, the virus, if we all work together, everybody benefits, you know, everybody's just got to follow these rules. Now, I want to get, because we're running out of time and I have another class that I need to uh, speak with as well, but it's about the same thing. Um, Taylor, on the other hand, he is rejecting law. So this is the other paper you're going to look at. Taylor thinks, wait a minute, if it's about everybody following the rules and everybody doing this because everybody will benefit, that sounds good, but what do you do with a government or society where not everybody lives the same way or believes the same thing? What are you supposed to do? So what he wants to say is like, well, wait a minute, you have to weigh it out because sometimes yeah, you can do what's best for everybody, but sometimes when you do that, you leave out minority groups. Some people don't agree with that. So how do you respect different people's idea of what a good life is? You know, how does the government weigh that out? So he's particularly, what he means by this is that there's two types of uh, politics. This is relevant if you're from my other class and you're coming in early. This is relevant to what we're going to talk about. Politics of universalism and politics of difference. So politics of universalism is what I was talking about and what Rawls is about. That everybody follows the same rules. Everybody does the same thing. It's the same rules for everybody. No one, no exceptions. So if you break the law, it's, well, you suffer the consequences like everybody else. Politics of difference, however, is saying, well, wait a minute, people are different. What do you do with different groups and they have different rights? You can't just treat everybody the same and won't we'll solve all the problems. So this is why he's saying, well, when you want to get equal rights, that's the politics of universalism. But the politics of difference is that you want to treat everybody with equal respect and you want to recognize that they're different and that's going to be problematic for both sides you can see this right because then you're going to ignore groups like i'll give you a couple of examples uh, native american groups that's the whole thing with casinos and what they can do on tribal land and what they're allowed to do versus what other people are allowed to do do they get special rights or not because of who they are? That's a big issue. Uh, and with the politics of difference. Mute. We're going to mute everybody as soon as they come in. Okay. And then the politics of difference is that um, the problem there is that well, then if you're going to treat everybody differently, how can you have rules that are going to work for everybody? So does everybody see the difference there? Those two issues, right? How do you have rules for everybody but respect their differences? But then how, on the other side, 
how do you make sure to treat people differently and respect them? Do you guys see the conflict? Because this is relevant, particularly for Taylor. So, going real quick, real, uh, Taylor, as you can see, he looks like just a regular white guy. However, and I know this personally because I've experienced this, he lives in Quebec. He's what they would call Quebecois, which means he's French Canadian. They have their own culture. They have their own language. The French that they speak is really different from the French in Paris and, and France. They have their own thing. They have, and so in Quebec, you can see the Walmart. They have the signs in French first, then in English second. And they do that because they want to protect their culture. This kind of annoys and pisses everybody else off in Canada because the the one province, it's like the state that has French as the first language and has everything in French. Everybody else, while they have French also, it's not the main language. And they have a really different culture. So how do you have the same rules and everything for everybody here in this country of Canada but at the same time then respect Quebecois and their culture and their language which I think is not that different from what we do here on the border right how do you respect different people's culture and different people's languages in the same place So that's where the whole business about um, you see the, the the problem with you can have universal rules for everybody. Everybody follows the same thing. You want to be just that way or you want to be just by paying attention to people's differences and respecting them. So they can they can conflict. They can conflict that way. Does that make sense so far? Yes, no? So far, yeah. So how does universalism, however, be blind to differences? Like, can I create my absolute magnificent rule book Letting everyone in everything, so everybody applies the same rules to everyone, right? I mean, that's what they want, but yeah, that's why it's a problem because I can give you a very concrete example of that. Is that let's say right now, I say everybody has to follow the same rules and turn in all the assignments at the same time. But let's say somebody doesn't have internet because of where they live or they can't get like particular places or excuse me, they don't have a computer. Like how are they gonna should I treat everybody the same still or do I take into account like some people have personal issues that I have to consider. Okay, so politics of universalism is I have rules and everybody has to follow them. I don't care right. about anything, no context, you follow them. Politics of differences tries to be flexible, not by making new rules, but to make the current rule more flexible to those exceptions. They might have an exception. Yeah, it, it might be a, more of an exception. Yeah, so it's like uh, that's why I brought up like Native Americans is that um, they say, well, 
a lot of states are against gambling, right? So they have no gambling laws, except the reservations have a different right that goes over the state right, which is the whole fight in like Texas and in New Mexico, right? So the Tigua uh, Casino and everything was a big issue because the state is saying one thing and the the tribe says, well, we can do something else. Like, and how does the government, the US government deal with that? So politics is different is trying to respect different people have different kind of rights, but it does run into the same problems because then how do you have different rules for everybody and then how do you keep track of all that? How do you make sure that's all fair? Everybody follow along? So far, yeah. Okay, so in the end, this is what Taylor's gonna propose. And I know the other class is starting. It's fine, guys. This is for my other class. Same thing we're talking about in our class is that what Taylor is saying in the end is that if you try to go, I guess, weigh it out between the two, he wants to say that, oh, the slides died on me. Uh, he, what he wants to say is that let his solution to it is that let's go with universalism for the most part, the same rules for everybody, except when something like tribes and Native Americans like want to see, then it has to be kind of like a case by case basis. Then we're gonna have to look at that particular situation and weigh it out. And if we rule though that this situation is threatens their culture, like the rule violates their culture, it uh, of who they are, their identity, then they should be exempt from it. So he says most of the time we'll go with protecting their cultural identity is more important, but it has to be done by a case by case basis. So this is why I say this is two really 